So let's get going and open the curtains for today's event. Today, we have our founder and CEO of AppScode, the genius behind all of our projects, Tamal with us as the speaker. And all of his brainchilds are namely QBB, Stash, Wiser, QForm, QVault, and finally, Byte Builders. So without any further ado, let's jump into the program. And let me add this before starting. If you have any questions during the webinar, feel free to ask in the Zoom chat. We'll be answering in the Q&A part of the webinar. So Tamal, if you may start. Uh, thank you, Raghav. Uh, thanks everyone for joining today. So today we're going to talk about byte builders. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the Zoom chat. We'll try to answer them at the end. So, so kind of this is our agenda today. So we're going to show you the user interface, what this project does, uh, and some of the live demo of this project. So as you know, like, you know, uh, we have been working on this project called KubeDB, which is a database management system for Kubernetes. And up to this point, you know, we started the project in 2017. And up to this point, almost the last five years, we have been primarily working on the project where when you want to interact with this, uh, you know, these custom resources we have for the KubeDB project, you have to do it through, uh, you know, the KubeCTL CLI, or you can do it programmatically, or maybe you can create your Helm chart, but primarily you are interacting with this via the YAML files. Um, and which is great, you know, uh, this allows uh, anybody to automate or, you know, have a way to sort of store the data in a gate and all that. But this also presents an interesting challenge because as our project has matured, we're starting to have a lot of features and these YAML files are getting a lot more complicated and, and it is really hard to sort of keep track of what's possible, what fields to use in for what feature. Um, we have been working on our documentation, but to be really frank, it's still very difficult for end users to have to actually read all the documentation to understand what we do. So, so the need for a you know, way, user interface, uh, ideally in a web-based user interface has been there for a while. And we've been working on that for quite some time actually, it's been uh, quite a few years now at this point, but uh, we're finally at a point where we are ready to show this UI to you. And uh, today, so that's the UI we're gonna talk about. So this is going to be hosted under our Byte Builders domain. So the general model is that uh, there'll be like a two way you can use this UI. So, you know, uh, you can go to this Byte Builders website, which uh, kind of in a public, uh, uh, you know, sort of a alpha release, you can think about, uh, where uh, you can sign up, uh, you can import your own Kubernetes cluster. So it's seems like you bring your own Kubernetes cluster, connect to it, and then use the user interface. So you don't have to deploy anything locally. Uh, uh, I mean, you don't have to deploy the whole UI and all that components locally, you can have, uh, there are a few things that you need to deploy. We'll go through those. But once you are, those are deployed, uh, our hosted Kubernetes cluster, uh, so the hosted UI, will be able to connect to your Kubernetes cluster and you will be able to sort of use the interfaces. Right? So that's one way you can use. We are also uh, offering for our enterprise customers a way to use the same UI inside their own Kubernetes cluster. So uh, we are uh, essentially, if you are running inside your own you know, data center, or you know, cloud accounts and you want to deploy the whole UI there, you can essentially deploy a version of this uh, UI that we are building, it's called Byte Builders or we're calling it a App Score Container Engine, ACE. So that you will be able to deploy and use it. Um, so that will be available as a separate installer for our customers. So with that uh, general context, we're going to jump into the demo essentially and kind of walk you through how the UI works what features are already there and you know, what are the other things we are looking to work on going forward. Um, so with that, I'll switch back to my um, browser. So today we're going to use uh, essentially our sort of the staging environment because we have deployed additional fixes in preparation for this uh, presentation. So, so it's under a different domain. This is what we use for our sort of testing and staging integration. Uh, but 
uh, I'll walk you through this. So the production environment is going to be pretty much the same. It's a little bit behind at this time. So the first thing is, uh, you know, if you don't have an account, you will be able to essentially go, uh, you know, it's kind of like a GitHub. You give, give it a username, email address and password. Uh, you know, you sign up for a new account uh, or you can also use Google or GitHub to do this. Uh, so in, today I already have an account. So I'm just going to log into that account I have. Uh, interesting, I logged out. So yeah, so Like we have to clear some cookies, but that's good. Okay, um, so once you look into the account, you will kind of see a UI where you can see uh, the number of clusters you have, if there are additional members in your organization, if you are part of multiple organizations. So our user model is somewhat similar to what uh, uh, GitHub has. So essentially you sign up as an individual user and then you can join into an organization. So today I'm signed into this uh, apps code user uh, and uh, we have a few different organizations, but we're going to go through this flow. So once you have signed up, uh, we kind of have a model where uh, there are a few different applications, we call it sort of inside this platform. Uh, those are the console, uh, the KubeDB and Grafana. So Grafana is obviously the Grafana that we all know that's already hosted on our uh, site. Uh, console is sort of the Kubernetes, generic Kubernetes cluster uh, UI. So it's the web console for any Kubernetes cluster that you connect. And so you connect your cluster through this UI, you will be able to use it as a just generic UI. Uh, and then uh, uh, the KubeDB is the KubeDB specific UI. Uh, we'll go through that. So once you sign up, uh, you will have an account. So you can go to your settings. You know, you can see the username, password, and you can update some information. Uh, so, you know, you can update your password, you can uh, enable two-factor authentication, all of that good stuff. So with that, uh, and in case of our hosted account, there are additional information around, like, you know, if you have a billing or using usage information, all those, those will be available. So with that, uh, let's go into the uh, cluster uh, console UI. So this is what it looks like. Uh, in the console UI, um, you'll see a kind of a gallery view where you can see the existing Kubernetes clusters that you have connected to your uh, sort of this, our uh, dashboard or the, you know, the byte builders environment. I say here, I already have two clusters, but I'm going to go through how you can add a new cluster. So to add a new cluster, you can go to this import cluster. Here, uh, we have a few different options for adding a new or importing a new cluster. So please note that here, we are not provisioning a new cluster, right? So the cluster is already existing in your, uh, uh, you know, cloud or bare metal or some environment. We are just importing that so that we are able to communicate with that cluster. So essentially we are kind of trying to get the cube config file so that we can work with that. So if it is one of this uh, um, cloud providers environment, then you can use those. Or if it is a public, uh, you know, Kubernetes cluster that has a public IP address for the Kube API server, or essentially a Kubernetes cluster that is not in any of those specific environments, but something for which you have a, a Kube config file, you can provide us that file uh, and provide us a, you know, you can provide a name or you can just call it generic. So it just, it will work with any Kubernetes cluster. You can give it a uh, display name, and give, give, give it a cluster ID. So the cluster ID will become sort of part of the URL. So we recommend that you give it a unique ID, it will obviously validate. So you provide the cube config and you can import it. Uh, if it is a private cluster, what did, this means is that, uh, let's say you are running this Kubernetes cluster into an environment where the Kubernetes API server address is not publicly accessible. That is also possible uh, to be accessible via our hosted environment. So what we do is basically we'll give you a, a sort of a command uh, that you run. Once you run that, uh, so we are essentially using NATS as a way to communicate to that cluster. So we effectively have a tunnel open. 
but it will still uh, respect all your uh, correct authentication and authorization, right? So, so, that's, uh, so that's the beauty of this implementation. So today for this purpose of the demo, we're going to use Linode uh, when uh, kind of testing against their environment quite a bit. Uh, so we're going to use that. So to do that, what we need is first, we have to uh, add a credential. So if you go back to the settings page from this top right corner, you'll see a Kubernetes credential. So these are the sort of the credentials that you can use to essentially, if you are using one of those you know, cloud providers uh, to connect to that. So we can create a credential, you know, you can give it a name like a Linode credential. You can say that this is Linode and then you can provide a token, right? I mean, if you do a different one, let's say AWS, and you have to give those secret ID and access key ID. So we, we using this information, we are essentially going to use the cloud providers API. So let's say if you are on EK, EKS, we're going to call the EKS API to list your existing cluster so that you can kind of select those and just get connected. Uh, so, so today I already have a credential uh, pre-configured. So this is the create uh, Linode. So we're going to use this one, okay? So we go to Linode, go to next. So we picked the credential uh, and then we do next. And you will see that we already have a bunch of uh, clusters that are showing up. Uh, so if we go back here, uh, this is the Linode dashboard and we have like a bunch of clusters running here. So those are basically visible here with sort of the similar information uh, that is uh, basically read using the token. Um, and the ones that are not highlighted are the ones already connected to our environment. So uh, you don't need to connect them again. So let's say we're going to go with this uh, cluster called ACE. So we import this. So as you saw, when you try to import, it's asking for a display name. So you can give it any name, like you can have the spaces in that and all that. But uh, for the cluster ID, uh, no spaces. This is going to be the URL, so make it unique. And uh, you know, for ideally just all small letter, uh, alpha num. So confirm it. Yeah, so the moment you con uh, connect it, um, it takes you to the sort of the home page for this cluster. So how we know this is you are in the ACE cluster because you can see that uh, we are selected, the ACE cluster is selected. Or if we go back to the UI that were, were before, here you can see that this is now showing up, right? Before it was, and you can see the timestamp has been imported just now. Before it was showing those uh, other sort of two cluster that were connected and this one was connected, but we effectively removed it or deleted the credential, so it's not connected anymore, right? Okay, uh, <clears throat> now when this cluster is imported, uh, so this is sort of the first page you see, so it has the sort of some of the basic information, uh, name, endpoints, UID, you know, the standard information that you expect from a cluster. And then important thing is it's connected, meaning like the credential that has been provided or has been automatically read from the API is valid. So we are able to communicate to that cluster. I mean, obviously, because that's how we are showing these nodes. So this data is coming live from the cluster, right? So whatever you have will be showing here. And then you can also click on the connect button. I'm not going to go to that page because it will show you the cube config file. So you can effectively you know, download the cube config file from here, right? Uh, so that's that. And uh, now, um, so in this cluster, we have like a four uh, different nodes. Uh, so you can effectively click on any of the node names and sort of see the details, right? So is this the detail that you can already see today uh, in your sort of using kubectl, but now uh, it's visible through the UI and uh, you know the conditions and information. I mean, you have seen this kind of UI from other projects. So in a way, this is kind of, you know, doing our, we are doing our version of it. So as a, as a part of the whole uh, you know, package that we feel like is a you know, kind of a table stakes at this point, right? But this has all the information that you need and, and that's kind of what. Now, there are a, a interesting stuff that I'm going to go into it. So uh, on the left-hand side, you see the various resources that are automatically configured. And these are sort of, we uh, show a set of resources that are sort of uh, what we think kind of will be necessary. Um, and uh, so, but this default settings or this left panel can be configured, right? So if we can click on this gear icon, you can go here, you can uh, change the display name again. We're not going to do it today, 
uh, you can go to the sidebar and you will be able to essentially add, remove uh, items here, right? So for example, on the right-hand side, we have HCD in the data store. If, you, if we go back, uh, right? But we are not really uh, QDB because the CRD is deployed, it is showing up, but you know, QDB currently doesn't really have a good support for HCD operator. So we want to remove this. So you can just uh, go to the sidebar uh, and uh, remove this, right? So drag it out, it will be gone from there, uh, save it. And then we're back. So click on this small triangle and we'll be back here. And if we expand it now, so you'll see that the data store doesn't show the, um, the HCD anymore. And this left panel configuration we just did, it is customized by per user, meaning like if you have five different user, uh, you know, using this UI, they, when they configure, it will be configured just for them, for this cluster. So it's not uh, globally configured for or modified for everybody, right? Um, so that's kind of how it works. And then the other thing is uh, when you import a cluster, you have to uh, connect the Prometheus, as you, uh, we told before that we are running a hosted Grafana, right? So the Grafana is hosted on our end, but the Prometheus is running inside that user's cluster. So to do, so what we need to do is essentially connect this Grafana uh, to uh, create a data source in this hosted Grafana that can connect to this Prometheus that is running inside the user's cluster, because that's how we will be able to show you dashboards. So to do that, in this case, what we do is that we're going to uh, uh, connect it via the Prometheus service. So it will use the Prometheus service and the Kubernetes API server to proxy connections to the Prometheus, right? So the, all the connections are still SSL encrypted and only possible because the user that I'm logged into this cluster right now, like the kube config that I've been using, has the permission to use all this uh, data. Uh, so you select Prometheus service, you know, uh, the, so we are, we have deployed uh, the, um, the Q, Q Prometheus stack, right? So I can actually go back and show you that. So if we actually go to the Helm uh, part here and you look at the releases, So we'll see that in this cluster, these different Helm charts are already installed and this Q Prometheus stack is the, the standard Prometheus uh, Helm chart that's uh, out there in the community. So that's deployed and with effectively just the default configuration. So there is no custom configuration provided and, um, and it has the history, right? So all the Helm CLI things that you see, right? The, the history, uh, the current manifest that has been deployed, and then the actual chart, right? So the actual chart the specific version and all its internal files, you can also like, you know, visit it from here. I mean, uh, yeah, so this kind of makes it easy to see what's the, out there. Uh, manifest is the actual YAMLs, right? The YAMLs that has been rendered and actually deployed in the cluster. So, uh, so here uh, we're going to use that, right? So we're going to use the HTTP scheme. This has been deployed in the monitoring uh, namespace. Uh, so if we actually go back, we can see it here. Yeah, so it's in the monitoring namespace. And uh, so we know the service name is going to be Q Prometheus stack Prometheus. So this is something you need to know that was the Prometheus service name, but uh, it's the default one. And then the port is the only port that's available here. So 9090 and we just uh, use it. So, and, and then we save and test. So basically it will save the data uh, and also uh, try to connect to that uh, cluster, uh, to the Prometheus server uh, in this cluster and um, make sure that the configuration that has been provided is successful, right? So the connection is successful, so the data is valid. So with that, uh, we have basically imported a cluster, kind of modified some of the left panel, looked at the uh, Helm chart that's installed in the cluster, and then uh, you know, also connected to the Prometheus uh, for the Grafana dashboard. So this will come in handy later. Uh, in fact, if you go to the Grafana dashboard, uh, so if you go to the data sources section, you'll see that uh, the data sources uh, are there. Uh, so it will, be, it will be visible there, okay? Uh, now, uh, here, 
what we are doing is that uh, the other thing that is like the standard workload uh, options that are available in Kubernetes, which is the deployments, replica sets, all of that. So those are also has a UI here, right? And, and uh, so if you click on this, you get the list and by default, you see all namespaces. You can you know, pick a namespace and sort of drill down into that namespace. Uh, so, so let's say if you get into inside a uh, deployment, so then this is where uh, I think things get more interesting because we see a lot more data. And we'll come back to this when you get to a database, uh, but here, uh, all the data that is not just the standard, like the kind of the basic info or the YAML steps or the, uh, you know, just the events or the YAML, not just that, but we also show if you have a backup configured that information. So if we actually go to one of the databases, we will be able to see that, right? So, uh, or, or if we actually go to the stateful set because the database that's running for that stateful set. Uh, so I don't have it configured in this cluster, but if I go to a different one, I'll actually come back to this maybe a little bit more later. This is another cluster where uh, we have everything pre-configured, so it's easy to show you uh, so that we don't have to do the whole thing again on the demo, but uh, yeah, so like here uh, we have a, this, uh, you know, a Mongo uh, deployed, and if we go to the uh, sort of the backups, we can see kind of the, the repository that has been configured, the backup configuration, all the recent backups, and and you know any other con jobs and information that's uh, available out there will be visible here. Uh, uh, same with monitoring, right? So if you have a set up a service monitor that's visible, you can kind of click on that and it will take you to the service monitor page, so you can kind of see the detailed information of that monitoring and. Uh, and this is really, I would say, if you are a DevOps engineer or somebody who's really well-versed in sort of Kubernetes, for them, this is actually showing a lot more data, right? Like all the connections that are available or possible is kind of shown here. Uh, and then if you click on the monitoring, you can, uh, here you can see the pods, the services, and then actually if you go to the monitoring, you will also see the Prometheus, uh, I mean, which it is connected to, I guess right now it's not, that data for that. So, uh, so this uh, flow uh, shows us a lot of this data. I mean, kind of all the possible connections. So it's not just the owner reference or typical information you see, but it's all the data that's available as a connection to this resource. And, and that's all kind of is actually showed in this, uh, in the resource graph. So in this particular case, it's a very simple because it's just a service monitor. But if we go back to one of those uh, stateful sets, let's go back to that. Uh, we'll see a lot of interesting data there. So let's get there, research graph. So here it's quite interesting, right? Now here we have a database, a stateful set. This is actually the database. I mean, I know the name of the database, right? So this is the, uh, this is, you can see that if you hover over it, you can see that it's a kubedb, mongodb database in the demo name space. And, and like all the sort of the, all the things that are connected, right? All the different types of resources that are connected. So we kind of show it as a, uh, you know, labeled graph, right? So it gra each label gra edge or uh, the connection in between these vertexes has a uh, label, right? Like if it is exposed by, meaning it is like a service. Uh, if it is an offshoot, meaning directly connected, if the port actually running on this node, so you can, in a quick way, you can kind of see what's uh, happening with this um, particular sort of resource and its collection of sub resources. Uh, so this is uh, quite interesting and you can click on this. So if you, if I click on this sort of the database name, it will actually take me again to the database sort of the basics page, right? So here we have all the same sort of information, but now it's for the actual uh, MongoDB object, right? So, so that's kind of the, I think that's something unique, I believe uh, that we have uh, with our environment or uh, by builders. Uh, here uh, for the database, uh, we have a lot more information. I'll come back to that a little bit later, but uh, that's kind of the overall uh, what's possible with this uh, UI, right? So it has also has things like if you do configs or secrets, let's say I go to the secret uh, and you know this has all the secrets. Uh, we can pick a secret. I mean, this is a reddish secret actually. Uh, so you can see uh, sort of the, you know, the data in there, right? By default, it will not be visible, but like, 
you can make click on this button it will show you the data what's actual value here you can sort of copy the data uh, you know you can uh, you can modify it if you would like to uh, i mean i'll, I'll uh, yeah so if you want to you can sort of modify one two three save it will it will save the data so and 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 it was also it's kind of like a uh, the vs code style uh, sort of preview so if you make any changes it will show you left and right so you can see which line has changed right so um, and then you can obviously add additional keys, right? So I can add like a, a new key. So one thing will be that uh, with the, uh, yeah, so yeah, so you can add new keys. Uh, I think what, one thing I would need is uh, basically the actual YAML, I believe, uh, to do it um, because, sorry, the base 64 encoded version, let's say I want to add a new one, so that to be and this value, yeah. So now I have another key B and uh, it is, uh, it has the same data. Oh, well, actually it got the YAML uh, string itself. And if you come here, you can see it, right? Uh, and then if you want to change it, uh, we can uh, change it again. Let's say, let's just call it road. Say, right, so it's, it's that. Um, and then the other thing is like this secret is currently only used by this pod. So the used by, I mean, we'll probably work on some of the headlines, but so you can see that this is used by this pod, right? So this is this is mounted. Actually, in this case, this is uh, mounted into this uh, pod, I believe. Uh, and if you click on this name, it will take you to the details, right? So you can see where it is running. Uh, so. So now you are into the, uh, you know, sort of the details for this pod and it has all the information that you would expect for a sort of a pod details page, right? I mean, it can be a little over, overwhelming because it's like so much data, uh, but if you are kind of doing like a, you know, looking for something, uh, this will be quite helpful. So, so now kind of we showed you this and obviously you can come to this resource definition here, you can see the, all that stuff. I mean, I can kind of get rid of this fails. Once I do, if we go to the preview changes, the same thing, you can see that the, we we're removing these two lines and if we do save changes, it will get applied to the cluster, right? So these are the, some extra fields we added. And then now if we get back here, I mean, obviously those are gone, right? So as you'd expect. Similarly, you have all these uh, other resources and this is not just the official resources or the resources that apps code provides like the custom resources, but even the, for example, things like Prometheus, uh, those are available here, right? So the things that are deployed uh, in this particular cluster, we don't have it deployed, but if we go to the, some of the other ones, like the Hello cluster, uh, you'll see those uh, properly deployed. Yeah, so here, like you can see that it's been deployed, right? So all the information and all the, all the Prometheus custom resources will be there. In the security section, you can see uh, the RBAX uh, that's available there, and uh, you know who who, it is, who is using those. So this is actually the port PSP. Uh, the RBAX are here uh, in the role section actually. Um, so, like if we click on one of these RBAX, it'll show you uh, you know what are the role bindings that are connected to this and, and if there's a multiple ones, uh, all that you'll be able to see. Uh, so that's kind of the overall uh, sort of this part of the UI. So with that, I'm going to now jump into the uh, KubeDB specific part, right? So as I already told, like this is focused on um, kind of making it a proper uh, Kubernetes dashboard, uh, web-based console, I mean, you know, uh, and making it work for any, not just the official ones or the custom ones and, and, and all the details that you are seeing here uh, has a quite a bit of details and, and for each type of resource. Now with that, uh, we're going to go into uh, the KubeDB section.